Thank you, Peter. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm well aware that I'm the speaker standing between the audience and a long-awaited lunch. So I will try to be succinct. And I was charged with answering the question, should it be considered the standard of care for low-risk disease? So just by way of background, to emphasize the very high prevalence of microfocal prostate cancer in men, the chance of harboring disease approximately one's age as a percentage, and uh, the disease initiating in the 30s with uh, typically a 40 or more year natural history from inception to clinical progression and metastatic disease and death. So some basic facts, 50% of men over age 50 harbor these microfoci versus the lifetime mortality risk of about 3%. The lower the PSA threshold for biopsy, the more cases we will find. Uh, the number needed to treat is high, whether it's 48, whether it's 15. This is still a lot of treatment relative to the morbidity associated with surgery and radiation for localized disease in indolent cases. Uh, the controversy is really over the risk of the delayed therapy in patients managed expectantly. There's a couple of very recent uh, data sets that I think are very germane. This one was just published recently by Monique Rubal and Fritz Schroeder, amongst others, and it's an attempt to address the very critical question, what is the threshold for clinically insignificant prostate cancer? And most people here probably know that the traditional definition, which has been widely used for 25 years or more from Tom Stamey, is 0.5 cc's or less of Gleason 6 prostate cancer. And this was based on cystoprostatectomy specimens done at Stanford, and he determined that the uh, incidence of prostate cancer was 8% at that time, and that the threshold for the 8% highest volume cancers in the cystoprostectomy specimen was 0.5 cc's or more, and that's where it came from. So this group used the same approach with ERSPC data, and uh, in the contemporary approach, it's gone from 0.5 cc's uh, to 1.3 cc's as the threshold for clinically insignificant cancer. And I would put forward that that is a whole different ballgame because we are very good at finding 1.3 cc cancers, and if it means that, we, that anything less than that, particularly if it's low grade, is clinically insignificant, it makes our job a lot easier. It certainly reinforces the case for conservative management for a lot of these patients. Now, Peter Albertson briefly showed this very important study uh, of 24,000 radical prostatectomies with 20-year follow-up. But I just want to focus on this box here, which is the Gleason 6 in men in their 60s. These were pathologically characterized, so this gets around the whole issue of undergrading that bedevils a lot of the data in this field. The extraordinary thing about this is that the men who had true Gleason 6 on radical prostatectomy had virtually no deaths from prostate cancer, 0.2% at 20 years. And in fact, insofar as the outliers are often the clue to what's going on in biology, I asked the author, you know, what's the story with those 0.2%? And it turns out that in fact all of those handful of cases harbored Gleason 4 pattern on reanalysis. So in fact, the prostate cancer mortality in these Gleason 6 patients was zero in 10,000, pardon me, 12,000 men. So if this disease had any lethality, you would expect to see at least some deaths, and I think this really reinforces the idea that Gleason 3 pattern should not be seen as a cancer with metastatic potential. It should be seen as a lesion that is associated with an increased risk of higher grade disease, but by itself does not pose a threat of metastasis, and that's a very important shift in thinking. So I think we can agree, based on everything that's been said, the concept of selective therapy is robust. The application is evolving, and that's where you get the controversy, how to select patients, how to do it, to emphasize there is no risk-free strategy. You treat all patients, you still get some deaths from prostate cancer. Uh, the issue is to balance the risk of morbidity of therapy with the risk of progression to incurable disease. 
And so the approach that's been taken by now about 10 groups around the world who've published on surveillance, generally there's a consensus that the D'Amico criteria for favorable risk should apply. Some restrict surveillance to patients who fulfill the Epstein criteria. Actually, it's only two, uh, two or fewer cores, even with extended biopsies. Jonathan Epstein's very adamant about that. No more than half of involvement of any one core. We have applied these criteria to younger patients under the age of 60, uh, and some people apply, uh, feel that should be a, an inclusion criteria, period. I would say given, uh, certainly uh, amongst other things, the recent data that I've just showed from the ERSPC group and the uh, Egener series, that uh, overly stringent approach to Gleason pattern three uh, should be questioned. And this is about half of newly diagnosed patients. So just to emphasize the numbers, there's 150,000 men in the United States and Canada per year. There really is no other single grade and stage of cancer that approaches those numbers in the whole oncology field. Now, one of the issues is what criteria should be a trigger for intervention. We have used PSA kinetics for almost 15 years. We're now moving away from this for reasons which I'll come to. We arrived at a doubling time of three years as a threshold for intervention, which is 20% of patients approximately in a surveillance cohort. Uh, we do confirmatory biopsy. This is very critical uh, to identify the uh, disease that was missed on the initial biopsy, particularly in the anterolateral horn and anteriorly and then every three to four years once that's done, the Hopkins group does this annually, uh, which makes sense perhaps for the first few years, but it's hard to justify this after five or 10 or 15 years. That just seems like a, a heck of a lot of biopsies. The results are that grade progression is seen in about 15 to 20%. In almost all cases, this is to Gleason three plus a minority element of four, more than 90%. And I'll come back to how MRI and biomarkers may be used going forward. Now, there is no question that PSA kinetics are a fickle partner in the management of these patients. And the reason is partly related to the biologic variation of PSA. We took in our cohort of about 450 patients, the two-thirds of patients were completely stable, no progression, no metastasis, uh, no grade progression. And we looked at the performance of various PSA triggers. We used this uh, general linear mixed model. The details don't matter. But just to say that whether you use PSA velocity above two, and Anthony D'Amico alluded to this before, uh, or various other triggers, incredibly high prevalence of a transient rise in PSA that looks quite rapid over time if you follow these patients. There's also, here's data from Hopkins that showed that in men on surveillance, some of whom were treated for progression beyond Epstein criteria, the PSA kinetics were not predictive of adverse biop uh, pathology. And uh, you can see adverse favorable, adverse favorable, adverse favorable, really no difference in any of the various ways of evaluating PSA kinetics. And then here is this overview by Andrew Vickers systematic review of pretreatment PSA velocity and doubling time as prostate cancer predictors. And basically, uh, he dismisses the entire body of literature in this area as being either not reliable, not having robust endpoints, or in fact, not showing a benefit. And you can see here, worse area under the curve in the majority of the studies comparing PSA velocity to PSA alone. The studies that do show a benefit in the ROC curve show a modest benefit. And here's his very challenging conclusion. Little evidence that pretreatment PSA velocity or doubling time are of value for early stage prostate cancer, no justification for the use of PSA dynamics in the clinical setting. So having said that, we've used this for a long time. I'll just summarize the high points of our data and, and those of others. About a third of patients have been treated 62% free of intervention at 10 years. This is a summary of the world experience, and this is the percent on surveillance on the right. And you can see that while there's a range overall, about a third of patients end up uh, being treated 
after being reclassified as higher risk over time. And this is our overall mortality. This is in the 450 odd patients that we published. So uh, many of these patients eventually die. It's 32% mortality at 10 years, but they don't by and large die of prostate cancer. So this is the, the 10 year prostate cancer mortality adjusted is 3% in our series. And in fact, only 1% of the patients have died. So that the 3% is the actuarial calculation. And of those five out of 450 who died, uh, at least three of them, w without a doubt, would, in retrospect, would have succumbed to metastatic disease regardless of how they were treated. The other point is that the longest doubling time in this group was 1.6 years, which characterizes less than 10% of the patients. So uh, I'm, I'm not ready to give up on PSA kinetics completely, although the evidence is debatable. And this experience is consistent with that published by others. Uh, the Prius series is now closer to 1,000 patients, so this is a little out of date. There's very few prostate cancer deaths overall, one so far in the Prius series that I'm aware of. We have five with somewhat longer follow-up. Overall, prostate cancer mortality remains very low. Now, as a challenge to this approach, the, the current issue of the New, New England Journal has the updated Bill Axelson Holmberg Scandinavian randomized trial. It's extremely interesting. All the trends have continued. There is a roughly 45% uh, reduction in prostate cancer mortality, number to needed to treat seven for men under 65. But they particularly focus on low risk patients. And here is low risk disease. And perhaps somewhat surprisingly, there is a significant benefit in radical prostatectomy compared to watchful waiting in the Scandinavian series of low-risk patients. But I think really, the, and, and this I have no doubt will be widely interpreted as a strike against the concept of conservative management. And yet, were these patients really low risk? So I've put in here, I understand that this is completely not statistically valid because these are different cohorts, but just by virtue of comparison, here is our mortality that I just showed you in the active surveillance cohort compared to the watchful waiting. So these patients are not comparable. The, the uh, Bill Axelson series was pre-screening, much higher PSA based on sextant biopsies or aspiration cytology. This was really a group with a significant volume and uh, extent of disease compared to typical screen detected active surveillance patient. I, d I don't think this study should be interpreted as being, uh, as undermining the surveillance concept. We calculated the hazard ratio over time of uh, other cause mortality versus prostate cancer mortality. This is 19 to 1 in the overall population, really very reassuring to patients. The, the, the caveat is that the progression, the PSA progression rate in the treated patients is relatively high. It's about 50%. These are the patients in our cohort treated with surgery and radiation. Uh, there's many reasons for this, including the fact that the radiation patients treated in the 90s got an um, inadequate dose of radiation in retrospect. But I just want to emphasize that this is about 50% of the 30% who were treated, or 15% of the overall cohort which is a relatively acceptable figure relative to the PSA progression rate from uh, many series of surgery or brachytherapy, for example, uh, for Gleason 6 disease. A 10 to 15 PS, uh, percent PSA failure rate is, is quite common. But there's room for improvement. And uh, uh, this is just uh, relative to the question of what is standard of care. This was uh, published last year, and that is uh, a threshold analysis of being under surveillance. And this is the, the negative utility of being on surveillance. And in other words, how anxious do patients get and how adverse an effect does that have on their quality of life? And at least according to this analysis, surveillance had to have a very major impact relative to the likelihood of prostate cancer mortality before there was no benefit to being on surveillance. <laughs> 
Now, just conclude with I, where, where I think the field is going. We've heard a lot about MRI today, and this is a tremendously powerful tool, which I think is going to enhance surveillance going forward. And essentially what's been learned in the last few years is that the reason we are doing badly with some of these apparently very favorable patients is because of the missed anterior cancers. And this reflects the posterior approach of truss biopsy. It really makes sense. And here is, here is uh, one, <laughs> it's hard to ignore that. Here, here is one study uh, from Hopkins showing that 100% of the cancers more than one centimeter were anterior in a, an, in a radical prostatectomy group of patients previously on surveillance. I'm gonna bang through the MRI data uh, because Heidi did such a great job of summarizing this. Let me just conclude by saying that going forward, we're moving, I think, from the, the era of a kind of mystified view of the prostate where we know we've identified small volume, low grade disease, but we're worried, just like this carry map of Africa from 1805, we're worried about what's going on in the mysterious interior of the prostate. And in fact, I think going forward with imaging and biomarkers, we now are gonna be able to find these patients with the prostate evasive anterior cancers by MRI uh, in, the, uh, in selected patients early on, and the already very favorable outcome with active surveillance will get even better. Uh, five ARIs, just two publications recently demonstrated these may have a role, and I'm not going to dwell on that due to lack of time. So I think to conclude, clearly this is a standard of care. I wouldn't say it's the standard of care. There's clearly options for patients, and patient choice needs to come into this, but it's, it's clearly an option. that wide acceptance now that this makes sense. It's relatively safe as far as we can tell. Uh, with a very high rate of other cause to prostate cancer mortality, but there still clearly is work to be done in terms of validating uh, triggers for intervention and patient selection. Thank you very much.